All right, let's get started. We are back, everybody. Thanks for everybody joining. Uh, we're back with our Edit Chronicles. Today's message today is it ain't about works. All right, we're going to be talking from a familiar story about Mary and Martha. But again, I got another shout out this week. I want to first say hi to Mama Joanne. I just want to give a quick shout out and I love you and um, hope you're doing well. And I just want to shout you out real quick. Amen. All right. So today, 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 we are talking about a familiar passage in the uh, in the Bible, um, which is about Mary and Martha. Everybody knows about the story of Mary and Martha. Amen. Um, yes. So, yes, today we are talking about Mary and Martha, right? But today we're going to talk about how you don't have to work to get your way into heaven. Like a lot of people think or a lot of people are deceived to thinking. Amen. And we need to get to a place where we understand what God really expects of us. Because a lot of times, too, we go about this life and we don't know what God what God wants for us. And it's sad because... God really does want us to know truly what he wants for us. And it's sad in the aspect, I say it's sad because it's not, not really sad, but it is kind of sad that there's people that's been serving the Lord many, many years and still don't know that works can't get you into heaven. And this is what we're going to talk about today because I think a lot of times we equivalent works with salvation and that's not how God has, that's not how God sees it. All right. So let's just pray and then we'll break it down. Amen. So, Heavenly Father, God, we thank you for this day, and we thank you all for all that you're doing in our lives. God, we just pray over this word today, God, Lord, we know that your word is perfect, God, and your word is is just, it's sharper than any two-edged sword, God, separating soul and spirit, going down to the bone and marrow, God, dividing asunder, God, in Jesus' name, and it's even the discerner of the hearts and desires of the heart, God, in the name of Jesus. And we just pray right now, God, that this word would just penetrate our hearts today, God, in Jesus' name. Put me to the side, God, and just bring forth what you want to bring forth in this word today. Amen. So, um, heaven, so not heavenly father, Lord. So, yeah, so today we're going to be talking about Mary and Martha. So we're going to go ahead and start. Um, so, yes, so it's in Luke 10 38 through 42 amen so yes um yes so let's read so luke 10 38 so it says now it came to pass as they went and he entered into a certain city he being jesus um and a certain woman named martha received him into her house and she had a sister called Mary. This is not the mother of Mary, by the way. This is Mary and Martha, Lazarus's brother and sister. So, um, and which also sat at Jesus' feet and heard his word. But Martha was cumbered about much serving and came to him and said, Lord, don't, does thou not care that my sister has left me to serve alone? Bid her therefore that she help me. And Jesus answered and said unto her, Martha, Martha. Thou art careful and troubled about many things, but one thing is needful, and Mary has chosen that good part, which shall not be taken away from her. Amen. So we know about, this is such a simple story. What is it? One, two, three, four, one, two, three, four, five verses. But it, it's so powerful, this story, because it talks about really that we need to get our hearts right. Amen. That's the first thing. It's a heart posture. And the reality of this story is that Martha and Mary both were in the same place. They both were in the presence of Jesus. They both had access to him in that moment. Have we ever really thought about that? Mary and Martha were at the same place, but they were in two different places. Say that again. They were in the same place, but they were in two different places. Amen. And that's the thing. They both had access to Jesus, but they were in two different places. They both were in the presence of the Lord, but they were in two different places. Your ex and the thing is about 
them both having access, but only but being in two different places, right? They both had access to Jesus, but they were in two different places. But to have true access to Jesus, it comes from your heart and where your heart is positioned. Amen. Mary's heart was positioned at the feet of Jesus. And Martha's heart was fixated on serving and not receiving in the moment what Jesus had for her. All right. So they were in both in the presence of Jesus, but they were in two different places. And the thing is, is that Martha was fulfilling her job description as a woman, right? Any woman that's on here, when you know that you have company coming to the house, what are you going to do? You're going to make sure the house is straightened up. And this is not sexist. This is just what women do, right? Guys could care less. But women, they want to make sure that the guest is felt comfortable, you know, that they clean up the house, that the house is not dirty, that, that the, everything is straightened out for their guests. So Martha, we can't really blame Martha because Martha was doing what anybody else probably would have done, right? So she was just doing what she was normal, what was normal. She was doing what 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 any other woman really was going to do really but really if you look at it aside from her really doing what what she was going to do anyway she was going through the motions she was performing a routine she was going by the way hi auntie linda hope you're doing well she was going by the way of a routine right she 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 was just going through the motions in that moment right and the thing is, is that she took her routine into the presence of God with her instead of laying aside every weight that would have been, would have be easily beset her, right? She took her routine into the presence of God instead of laying aside those things that would have easily beset her, right? Martha was so focused on preparing for Jesus that she missed Jesus. Let me say that again, because that's very powerful if you think about that. Listen again. Busy preparing for Jesus that she missed Jesus. Jesus was right in front of her, and she was so busy preparing for him that she missed him. Right? The thing is, is that we put Jesus into our routine instead of making Jesus our focus sometimes. And this is what Martha did. Martha fit Jesus into her, her routine instead of putting the sole focus on him. And if you think about it, this is us a lot of times. A lot of times we get so focused on getting ourselves ready for church, right? We get ourselves ready. We just, we, we go through the motions, amen? We clap our hands. We know how to clap our hands, right? We know how to do this. We know how to do this to get ready for Jesus that sometimes we miss him, right? And sometimes we get into God's presence and we feel like we have to put on a show and get ourselves together to receive him. You know, we worship him for what he can give us instead of who he is, right? And when you worship him for what you can get from him, instead of worshiping him for who he is, you end up preparing for him and miss him, right? We don't know. The Bible doesn't say what Martha really was why Martha was so fixated on serving him. We don't know if maybe she, if she would have sat at the feet of Jesus, maybe something in her would have been convicted. Maybe something in her would have been confronted, you know, or maybe it was a sense of pride. We don't know, right? And it's a good thing we don't know because we would have pinpointed it to that one thing. But sometimes God will allow things open like this so that it can relate to our own lives. What are you doing that's distracting you from the feet, from being planted at the feet of Jesus? What are you doing even that is serving the Lord that's blocking you from missing him? What are you doing to serve him that's causing you to miss him? Okay, think about that. Think about that very, very, very hardly. What are you doing even for him that's causing you to miss him? You know? The thing is, is that sometimes we, the, the, sometimes we feel like we got to get ourselves together. You know, sometimes we, we feel like we got to, um, even if you're trying, even some people I hear sometimes they say, I got to get myself together before I come to church. You know, I got to get myself together before I can, you know, come into the presence of the Lord. But the reality is you cannot get yourself together on your own accord. You know, Mary was so fixated on fixing up the house for Jesus 
that Jesus was right there willing. Even Jesus would have been able to help her, you know, with whatever she needed. Let's look at it from a spiritual aspect. You know what? Some people feel like they have to get themselves together before they can come into the presence of the Lord. But the reality is, is that you cannot get yourself together on your own accord, but rather we need him to help us get ourselves together, right? A lot of times we bring a lot of unnecessary anxiety upon ourselves, thinking that we have to perform to receive him, amen? Thinking we need to do this, we need to do that, we need to get ourselves together, we have to pay this much money in tithes, we have to be able to um, clap our hands a certain way, shout a certain way, lift our hands a certain way to receive him. But reality is worship comes from the heart, right? It's a heart issue if you really think about it. And literally God is just wanting us to come and sit at his feet. That's all he is, saying to come and sit at his feet. You know, a lot of people think they need to be in a position serving the Lord to be able to receive him, which is not true at all. You know, even there's pastors out there. They're so fixated on sharing Jesus, even with people that they don't even take time to sit at his feet and receive of him. And how can you pour out of an empty vessel, right? A lot of times we perform in, we, we perform for Jesus to receive him. And this is what Mary Martha was doing. She was performing tasks to be able to receive him. And that's not what God is calling us to do at all. God literally just wants us to come and sit at his feet. He does not want to take the back burner of our lives. He wants to have priority in your life. The thing is, is that when God shows up, he wants us to drop everything. He wants everything to take the back seat. He wants to be the center of everything because he knows what you need. Even when you don't know what you need, God knows what you need. And there is nothing that can, there's nothing you can do to earn your salvation. Amen. There's nothing you can do to receive Jesus in your flesh. It's a heart issue. Amen. Just think about it. It's a heart issue. Amen. There's nothing you can do to receive salvation in the flesh. Amen. There's nothing. There's not enough serving you can do. There's not enough feeding of the hungry you can do. There's a not. A, there's not enough. Um. You know, laying hands on the sick. There's not enough giving. There's not enough giving money in the world to your church that can earn you salvation. But it's a heart issue. Amen. The thing is, is that we cannot equivalate works for salvation or sustenance at all. You know, Ephesians two eight through nine says. For by grace we are saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, it is a gift of God, and not by works that any man should boast. If we would earn salvation by works, it would be a sense of pride, because everybody would be in competition about how much how anointed I am, how much I did for the Lord. I'm more saved than you because I did more for the kingdom. No, God says here in Ephesians 2, 8 and 9 that it's a free gift. It's a gift that God freely gives you. Salvation is a gift freely given to you. Nobody is more saved than the other. Amen. Nobody, we all are scarcely saved, the Bible says. Amen. We are scarcely saved. The church is scarcely saved, the Bible says. So if we all are in the same boat, there's, not, there's nothing you can do to earn your salvation. Amen. There's nothing, there's no type of work on this earth you can do to earn your salvation or your sustenance from God. God will provide for all of your needs according to his riches and glory, the Bible says. He will provide for your needs. There's nothing you can do to, to earn the salvation of God. You know, like I said earlier, sometimes we go feed the poor. We serve in church. We're an usher. We pray for others. We speak in tongues. We lay hands on the sick. We cast out demons. All these things thinking that that's going to earn our way into heaven. That's, that's going to give us a place with Jesus. But that's wrong. It's wrong. These are all great things and these are all things that come after being saved, but they're not things that can earn you your salvation. They're not going to get God's attention in your life to give you what you need. Amen. Luke 10, 19 and 20 says, behold, I give you power to tread on serpents and scorpions and all of the power of the enemy 
and nothing shall by, by any means shall harm you, notwithstanding in, in this rejoice not that spirits are subject unto you, but rather rejoice because your names are written in heaven. This scripture is so powerful because it shows you who you are in Christ first. That you have power over the enemy. You have power over serpents and scorpions and all the power of the enemy. And by no means they shall harm you. But God is saying, do not rejoice because the demons and Satan have to be in subjection to you. But rejoice because your name is written in the Lamb's book of life. Be Rejoice because your name is written in heaven. So do not rejoice because you can lay hands on a, on a, on a sick person and... And they recover. Do not rejoice because you can call a, a spirit out of someone and they leave. Do not rejoice in the works of what you do. But rejoice that your name is written in the book of heaven. Rejoice because you are written. You are sealed with the seal of the Holy Spirit of promise. Rejoice because Jesus, the hope of glory, lives within you. You have to rejoice because of who God is. Your name is written in the Lamb's book of life. Your name is written in heaven because of who God is in your life. Amen. Your name is not written because of all the wonders you did for the Lord. No, you gain treasures in heaven for serving the Lord and doing all these things for the Lord. But that does not get you into heaven. Amen. That does not get you into heaven. What gets you into heaven is receiving Jesus in your heart. It's a heart issue. What can keep you out of heaven is not receiving Jesus. Amen. That's the thing. You have to know that this is a heart. No, the way to get to God's heart is you accepting him and believing him in your heart. That is the way to get to Jesus. Your way to get to Jesus is not through serving and thinking that God is going to take his eyes and put them on you because you're serving. That's not how it is. Because a lot of times we do that. A lot of times we serve the Lord and we do all these things. And to, to try and get God's attention, but that does not get God's attention. Sometimes you being still at his feet is going to get his attention because what happens is like Mary. Mary was at the feet of Jesus. Th there was, there was an attend, Mary's attention was solely focused on Jesus, that Jesus could pour everything that she needed into him in that moment. Jesus was not going to take his eyes off of Mary and look at Martha because Martha was doing her work. She was distracted. So Jesus was focused on Mary until Martha called his name and started complaining. That's when Jesus looked at her and was and rebuked her and said, don't don't blame Mary. Mary, Mary chose that good part, which should not be taken away from her. Don't we do that sometimes? Don't we don't we do that sometimes? Don't we serve God and we we run ourselves crazy because and run ourselves dry because we're working for the Lord? And we want to complain and say, well, this person ain't doing nothing for you, God. Tell them to come help me. Tell them to work like I'm working. God is saying, no, you working is not going to get my attention. God is grateful that we work for him. But if we're only working to get his attention, that God is like, nah, I'd rather you stay still and not do anything. I'd rather you just sit at my feet and gain what you, what you receive from me than you working and trying to get my attention. That's the thing. I don't want you to get it twisted thinking that works are a bad thing. No, because the Bible says faith without works is dead. But it's faith without works. You got to have faith first. You have to have that, that intimacy and that relationship with you and the Father first before works can come. Because once you have that intimacy with the Father first, you're able to do the works based on the relationship that you have. If you have works before faith, now your works are going to equivalent how much faith you have. Right. And now the works that you have, you know, now you're going to now you're going to be prideful in your works and you're going to think you're going to be able to gain from God because of your works. It doesn't happen like that. Amen. And let me tell you, I'll be very transparent. There was one time I told God I was this was me being a young Christian in my mind, not being really mature, not really. I'm like, God, I'm doing all this stuff. for You how come I didn't get any desire in my heart? I'm doing this work for you. I said, God, I'm doing all this work for you, God. How come I haven't gotten the desires of my heart yet? And God told me, God says, I don't, I don't really care what you do for me. I'm more concerned of what I can do in you. Amen. And that's what God told me. God says, I'm not really concerned about what you do for me. He's, and he's, he said he's very grateful for the work that I've done for him. But he's like, that's not his main priority of what I can do for him. 
his main priority and what he told me is I'd rather be focused on a work I can do in you. You know, a lot of times God's got to do a work in us first before we can genuinely and have the true anointing on us to be able to do a work through us. Because the thing is, is that when you overcome certain things, when God has brought you out of some things and he's done a work in you, you have now an anointing on that area in your life. You have overcome that thing. So now you have an anointing on that thing. The thing which you've overcome, you have now an anointing for that specific area in your life. So when God brings you out of something, that's when you can be effective in that area and ministering to someone else because you have empathy now in that area. You have compassion for people because you've been through it yourself. So this is something we got to do. We got to stop focusing on God, what I can do for you, thinking that's going to get God to bless us because that's not the case. God wants to do something in you first before he can do something through you. Amen. And that's not saying he can't do anything through you because God can use a donkey. If God can use a donkey with Balaam, God can use you, right? But God rather do something in you first so that you can pour out from a vessel that's filled with his presence. Amen. You don't want to be in a position being able to pour into someone and you have hurt and anger and rage and unforgiveness in your heart. Because what happens now that those people that you're ministering now becomes victim. Because if something triggers you, you're going to spew out all that hate and that, that, that toxicity on the people that you're ministering to. And this is why God is very strategic about putting people in positions. He makes, God puts people in position. He's the one that brings the promotion. Amen. And God will see fit to put whoever he wants in the position he wants. But if you think about it, God will make sure that he is prepared the person that he has called for a position. Amen. And God wants to make sure that you're fully equipped, but you have to be like Mary. You have to be planted at the feet of Jesus to be able to receive everything that you can have for. I didn't even plan on talking about the position thing. So somebody must need to hear that. You know, God wants to do a work in you before he can use you. Amen. And, and again, that's not a, that's not the only prerequisite for God using you because God can use you anywhere that you want. But to be fully effective and to have a full anointing on your life, you're going to have to really search within your heart and sit at the feet of Jesus and allow God. That's the only place you can sit at and truly receive from God. Because when you're at the feet of Jesus, there's no other distraction in the world. There's nothing that can take your eyes off of him. Amen. There's nothing that can distract you. When you're at the feet of Jesus, it's just you and him. And you want to have that intimacy with him. And again, I say this with this story to not think that you can serve him in your works or you think that you can do this, you can do that. And that's going to get God's attention to bless you because that's not the case. God wants you to be planted at his feet with a heart of repentance and a heart of, of flesh that you can be able to receive everything that he wants to give you. Amen. And everything that you need. Amen. Because the thing is, Martha really needed to ask in herself, why am I really serving? Why am I really doing what I'm doing? Is it to gain something or is it because I truly want to serve? So when you're serving the Lord, going back to works now, when you're serving, you have to ask within yourself, why am I doing what I'm doing? Am I serving because I truly have a servant's heart to serve or am I serving because it's something I'm doing to get God's attention to give me something. Amen. If you think about it, we all have parents, right? When you wanted something from your parents, what did you, I know us as kids, when we were younger, when we wanted something for our parents, we and when we needed something, we became really nice. Right? You become really nice to your parents. Mom, can can I wash the dishes? Can I do this? Can I do that? Dad, let me uh, like my sister one time, my my sister had to to uh tell my dad something. And she, my dad, my dad's a flea market man, right? So he loves the flea market. So this is when my sister, um, my sister was telling my dad that, uh, she got a boyfriend, right? <laughs> so, uh, Venetia don't kill me for telling this story, but, um, so my dad's a flea market man, right? So he loves the flea market. So Venetia had to tell my dad that she had a boyfriend, right? So, um, 
she she got up that morning. It was a Saturday morning. She told Dad, she's like, Dad, come on, let's go to the flea market. You know, this is not something she would normally do. This is something none of us would normally do. But she's like, come on, Dad, let's go to the flea market. You know, and so they went to the flea market. They had a good day. And then she came back and she told my dad that, you know, that she had a boyfriend, whatever. And my dad was like, oh, so that's why you were being so nice, right? So that's So that's like an example of... Why am I really doing the things that I'm doing? Am I doing it because I genuinely want to be nice or I genuinely um, have a servant's heart? Or is it because I'm looking to gain something? And we're all guilty of that. We're all guilty of, of uh, equivalating works with something we can gain, right? Because I do the same. I used to do the same thing with my parents. If I knew that I needed something, I'd be extra nice to them and ask them, like, what can I do? To help you. And then when you done buttered them up and they all happy and, and happy you did and helped them, then you then you slam them and ask them, well, can I have this? You know? So and that's what we do with God sometimes. We serve and we come to church even sometimes to get what we want. Right? We come to church. You don't even have to even be serving in a position. Sometimes we just come to church because we want a financial blessing. We come to church because we want a healing. We come to church because we need deliverance. All of that is great and dandy. It's great that you come to church and want to be in the house of the Lord. But if you're coming to church just to gain, there's an imbalance. There's an improper balance because to be able to receive, you have to learn how to give, even to God. This is why praise and worship is always before the word. Why is praise and worship before the world? Because praise and worship is a time where you can give God his praise. You can give God glory. You can give God what he deserves before we turn around and the word is given to us for us to receive what we have from him. So this is why we, this is a question we have to look at. Why am I serving or why am I doing the things I'm doing? And this is not only for God. Let's look at it for any, even with our relationships. Sometimes we're in relationships because we want to buy somebody's love. Sometimes we're, we're in friendships and they treat us horribly because we want to feel a sense of acceptance. Why are we doing the things that we're doing? Are we doing them to gain something? Or are we doing it because we genuinely in our heart wants to do it? So think about that. And we got to make sure we don't have ulterior motives in the way that we operate. We want to operate from a true place of genuineness. I don't think that's a word. You all know me and my words. Genuineness. I guess I think that's a word. Of genuinity. Amen. <laughs> yeah, look, look, a lot of people will look at me and start laughing again because I get texts every week about my words. So this is like a normal thing. So I'm going to say genuinity because I know that ain't a word. So I'm going to make it up. God wants us to operate out of a place of genuinity, amen, to be genuine in every little thing, even the littlest thing, to be genuine in who we are, to not operate in a place of, let me give you this so I can gain this, amen, then we just talk about that a couple weeks ago, go about Luke, in Luke, about loving your neighbors, right, the Bible said in Luke, I believe it was chapter 6, to love your neighbor and give freely to them. You know, that, that they would not, um, that give freely to them without asking for anything in return. Yes, it's Luke 6. We talked about this a couple weeks ago. I want to read it. Um, Luke 6, uh, verse 33. And if you do good to them, which do good to you, what thanks do we have for sinners do the same? For if you lend to them of whom you hope to receive, what thanks do you have? For sinners lend to sinners and receive much again. But you, but love your neighbors and do good. And lend hoping for nothing again. And your reward shall be great. And you shall be the children of the highest. For he is the kind unto the unthankful and to the evil. So even God is saying here in Luke 6, why do you give to receive? Because sinners do that. The evildoers do that. God is saying give to those that, that, that hate you. Give to those that don't, that don't even accept you. And your reward is great in heaven. And you're called children of the Most High. So that's for sinners. How much more should we do that for God? How much more should we serve God just for who he is? Amen. And just seek him in his kingdom. Because again, that's scripture. Seek ye first the kingdom of heaven and his righteousness. And then all these things shall be added unto you. God is not saying seek him for his hand, seek him for what he can give you, but seek the kingdom and his righteousness. 
Seek Jesus first for who he is. Seek him for his righteousness. Because when you seek him for his righteousness, now that righteousness comes upon you. And now, you be, now you're given the robe of righteousness. So when you seek God for who he is, when you're planted at the feet of Jesus like Mary was, now you can receive everything. Mary did not plant herself at the feet of Jesus for what she could get from him. She had an experience with him before, you know, so she knew who he was. So she planted herself at the feet of Jesus because of who he was in her life. She knew he was the Messiah. She knew he was the King of Kings. And she sat there because of who he was. And because she served him for who he was, he, she was able to receive from him of what he wanted to give her. Amen. So the thing is, again, we got to make sure we don't have ulterior motives in the way that we operate. Because even sometimes when they serve God, they're not, people serve God not only for the attention of God, but people will serve God so they can get the attention of man. So that they can get a name for themselves instead of lifting up the name of Jesus. If we look in Matthew 7 verses 21 through 23, not everyone that says unto me, Lord, Lord, shall enter into the kingdom of heaven. But he that does the will of the Father which is in heaven. Many will say unto me in that day, Lord, Lord, have I not prophesied in your name? And in thy name haven't we casted out devils? And in thy name haven't we done wonderful works? Don't this sound like Martha right now? And then I will profess unto them, this is what God is saying, I never knew you depart from me, the worker of iniquity. Amen. These people were just like Mary, right? They had access to Jesus. They were so focused on preparing the way with Jesus that they missed Jesus, right? These people here that Jesus was talking about, they said, we didn't, didn't we do wonders in your name? Didn't we prophesy in your name? Didn't we cast out devils to your name? They had access to Jesus, but they missed Jesus. They were working for Jesus and yet they still missed Jesus. They were doing things in the name of Jesus, but still miss Jesus. Why? He, Jesus said to them, I never knew you. What does new mean there? The word new means intimacy. I never had an intimacy with you. You did all these works for me. I was in your face when you were doing all these works for me. But yet I still never knew you. This is the same thing with Mary. Mary was in the face. I'm not Mary, Martha. This is just like Martha. Martha was in the face of Jesus, doing all these wonderful works for him. Doing all these wonderful works for him in whilst he was in the presence of them. But still, Jesus did not know Martha in that moment because Martha was not fixated on him. Martha did not have that intimacy like Mary did. Mary had an intimacy because she was planted at the feet of Jesus. She had that one-on-one -on -one time with him and she was able to receive from him. Martha was so busy doing works for him that she missed him. That's the same thing with these people here that casted out Jesus, that casted out devils in his name, that prophesied it in his name, that did many wonders in his name. They did all these things for him in the midst of him, yet missed him. I don't know about you. I don't want to be like that, though. I don't want to do all these wonderful things for Jesus. And then at the end of my life, God say, I never knew you. I don't want to be like that. And see, that thing is, is that they did all these works, but they did not have a relationship with him. They did not really know him as their father. There was no relationship. They were so worried. They worshiped the works. Let me say that. They worshiped the works instead of the one that they were, that the one that they were coming in the name of with those works. They worshiped the works instead of the one that they were coming in the name of with the works. Amen. They worship the works instead of the one who they were supposed to give the works to. Hey, Miss Cynthia, good to see you. And that's the thing. They were doing so much things and so many things to get into heaven instead of having that true heart of worship. The thing that gets you into heaven is your heart. It's the position of your heart. Amen. If Hitler... I'll say that if Hitler asked Jesus to come into his heart at the last moment of his life, he would have made it into heaven. We don't know if he did that. He could have. And he's no respected person. Y'all can come for me all you want. But I know my God. 
and I have intimacy with him and I know his, his healing and his, his deliverance and his forgiving power. If any man confess with his mouth and believe in his heart that Jesus is Lord, he shall be saved. Amen. It doesn't matter what works you did, even for Satan. If you confess with your heart and believe that the Lord, that Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart, you will be saved. Amen. So it doesn't matter what you did for the devil or what you did for God. If you don't have that intimacy or have, or have that heart posture to be one with God or to allow God to come into your heart, there's a lot of people working for Jesus that don't have Jesus in their heart. Do you know that? There's a lot of people that know of God even working for him, but don't even know him. That's a very dangerous and sad place to be at. But God wants us to have an intimacy, to know. he rather us... Have one-on-one -on -one time with him. Sacrifice our works. I'll tell you that. God rather, I believe that with my heart. God would rather us sacrifice our works for him just so that he can have a relationship with us. If it's one or the other, God would say, come sit at my feet like Mary. And let me get to know you. Let you get to know me. That's the God that we serve. He wants to have a relationship with you. He rather you put everything down that you think that you know, that's why Hebrews 12, Hebrews 12, 1, it says, casting aside every weight and every sin that easily besets us to run this race with patience. Why would Jesus say that? Because he doesn't want anything blocking you from a relationship. Many run the race, but one, one wins the prize. God wants us to win the race. God wants us to run the way race and not have anything to distract, you, to distract us, even if it's works for him. If the works are going to be the idol that we serve instead of God, God would say, put it down. God would have told, God told, God would have told Martha in that moment, stop doing that for me and come sit here. Amen. Because if it becomes an idol, if it becomes something that distracts you from having that one-on-one -on -one time, if, it, if you have an option to have one-on-one -on -one time with God and do those works and you choose those works over that relationship aspect, God would rather you throw the works in the trash and lay them aside and have that relationship with him. Because that's what God wants us to enter into a place of sonship. He doesn't only want us to be a servant, but he wants us to be a son, as a son, you know, to come into that place where we would have intimacy with us, that he would give us everything that he desires, but not seek him for what he can give us or, or so we can have a name for ourselves, but rather seek him because he is God. Amen. And the thing is, is that just like with a husband and a wife, God wants us not only to be a son, but we also are the bride of Christ, right? We are the bride. Not, well, not everybody is the bride. God wants us to enter in to be the bride of Christ. Not everybody that's saved is the bride. Amen. The bride suffers. The bride goes through trials. The bride go th grows, goes through tribulations for the marriage, for the sake of the marriage. Amen. And not everybody is willing to do that for God. So you have to fight with your life and go through some things to become the bride of Christ. Right. But let's just think of a regular husband and wife in the natural. If the wife or husband are always doing things for the other Without having any alone intimacy time, the other person will think that they're just buying their love. And I know any husband or wife that really love their spouse would say, I like nice things, but I'd rather have one-on-one -on -one time with you. I'd rather have intimacy with you. That's the same thing with God. If, we ha if we're so busy doing works, if we're so busy seeking to do things, thinking that's going to earn, our, earn God's love, or, or, or earn blessings, God's like, throw all that away and just come spend time with me. Amen? And the thing is, is that when Jesus did many signs and wonders, what did he do usually at the end of those times? He went back on the mountaintop and spent time with his father. Amen? Even those that are in an intimate relationship with God and do works for the kingdom, we know that after we are used by God, whatever way he uses us, we have to come back to him and come back to that same place where Mary is at the feet of Jesus to get refilled.
to just spend time with it. Let me tell you, the greatest moves that I've felt in my personal life has, and the many times that God has spoken words to me that has transformed my life has been in those one-on-one moments with God. It hasn't been hooping and hollering in church like people think when people think that they have to go to a revival to meet Jesus. That's the biggest lie that anybody could ever tell you, that you have to go to um, to an event or a revival to be revived by God. God. Revival starts in your heart. You get revival by having a one-on-one time with God and allowing God to put breath back into those dead parts of you, to revive those dry bones. Revival is literally recovery of breath. So those places in your heart, in your, in your soul that have been stifled by demonic attacks and hurt and pain, God reviving those parts and, uh, and healing you and delivering you of those parts is what revival is, right? Let me tell you, a lot of people will say that they, they don't got to go to church to meet God. Look, that's a lie too. You don't have to go to church to meet God, but the Bible says not to forsake the gathering together of yourselves, the assembling of the brethren. Let me tell you, there's something special about a corporate anointing and that when you're able to be grateful for someone else's blessing, the blessing will come upon you. And when you're able to come together and just worship with with your brothers and sisters, there's a special anointing that takes place that gives you strength, right? So it all works together together for the good. Everything works together. You don't need to go to church to serve God, but you need to go to church so that you can gain the strength of your brethren so that you can be there to be encouragement and that they can be there to encourage you. And we all can run this race together. Amen. But works will not get you into heaven. Amen. So the thing is, is that the relationship comes first. The Mary comes first before the Martha. Amen. The intimacy of the relationship with God comes first and then the works follow with your faith. Amen. Not the opposite, because the Bible says I've never seen the righteous forsaken or his seed begging for bread. But for you to be righteous first, you have to believe on God. You have to have that relationship with God to be the righteous. You know, the seed, you know, means that you have a relationship with him. Right. He, he's never seen the seed begging for bread. The seed means the children begging for bread. You know, the, it's the children aspect. Your works, by you doing works, you're basically begging for attention. You're begging for the bread of God. When you're doing your works, he's never seen the righteous forsaken or his seed begging for bread, right? When you put works before the relationship, you're basically begging for bread. You're begging for attention. You're doing this. You're doing all these things so you can say, look, look, look at me. Look what I'm doing. Look at me. This is what the Pharisees did. The Pharisees were so fixated on doing good works. The religious folk were so focused on doing works that they can be seen that they missed Jesus. The Messiah was standing right in front of them. That they, they were so focused on what they were doing that they missed who Jesus was. And they missed that Jesus was right in front of them. And the thing is, is that Martha's intentions were good, but the timing was wrong. You know, he is your provider and he will work out the details of your life. But the thing is, is that you just have to focus on worship. You have to focus on coming to him first, seeking him first and his kingdom and his righteousness. And then all these things will be added unto you. Whatever Mary was trying to gain from from doing all these works, God was right there to help her. But she didn't acknowledge him first. She did not acknowledge him first. You have to acknowledge God first. This is why the Bible says you should have no other gods before me. He's a jealous God. He's jealous for your attention. You don't think it was breaking his heart that he, he had Mary right in front of him, which he was grateful for, but it was breaking his heart that Martha felt like she needed to work so that he would accept her. That's the same thing. God, it breaks God's heart for us to believe that we have to do certain things to gain his love or to gain his acceptance. You know, a lot of us have believed the lie that we've gone so far from God and we've sinned so much that we got to make up lost time. We got to do this. We got to do that. We got to do this. We got to do that to try and gain all that time that was lost. But God is saying, no, he's going to restore to you all that the canker worm and the locust has ate. 
right? There's a sec, there's a double portion coming the springtime and harvest. All those things, God is a redeemer of time. He is time. He's alpha and omega. We don't ever have to make up for what we've lost because God is the one that makes up. All your job is to do is to worship. You be like Mary. You worship. Amen. We got to be like Mary. You know, a lot of people will look at Mary and think she was lazy, but they didn't see. They were looking at the physical instead of the spiritual. Right? a lot of people could have looked at Mary and be like, well, she was lazy. She let Martha do all that work. No, Martha's priorities were wrong. That's why Mary took her stand because she knew what who Jesus was. And she knows that Jesus deserves my full. When Jesus is in the room, he deserves my full attention. There's nothing I can do to get away from him, even if it's serving him. I'd rather just sit at his feet. There's nothing I can do to gain his attention. But when he's there, I'm going to give him his, my full attention. And the thing is, is that Jesus was not worried about Martha because she was working. He was paying attention to the one that was right in front of him, Mary. And when you come to the feet of Jesus, he will pay right attention to you. And he will give you what you what, what you need. Even with you not asking, he will give you what you need. And the thing is, is that uh, even though a lot of people look at Mary, you know, a lot of people look at Mary and they thought she was lazy, but Mary laid down a lot to sit at the feet of Jesus. She laid down her pride. She sat at the feet of Jesus in her own home. She laid down her pride, right? She laid down the approval of others. <clears throat> she didn't care that Martha was talking crap about her. She didn't care whoever else was mad at her for sitting at the feet of Jesus. She laid down her pride. She laid down her ability to perform, right? She didn't, get, she didn't need an applause or approval of man for doing this and doing that for Jesus. She knew that all the glory went to God. That's why she sat right there and was able to bask in his presence because of who he was in her life. And lastly, she laid down her need to provide, right? She realized that she didn't have what she needed in herself to provide. So she yielded herself to Jehovah Jireh, who is the great provider. Amen. Mary realized that she, that she knew that Jesus was everything that she needed in that moment, right? And that she... That her purpose was right in front of her. That she couldn't find purpose in serving him in that moment. But him being right there, she found her purpose in him. Amen. And that's the thing with us. We're never going to find our purpose in things. You won't find your purpose in, in a position. Your purpose first comes in God. Your purpose has to be found in Jesus first before he can give you a position. I'll say you that your, your purpose will never be found in a position. Your purpose first is found in Jesus who then gives you a position. There's a lot of people that are in positions out here that have no purpose because they are looking at the, the, at the job itself and they feel like they're fulfilling the position. They're fulfilling the position instead of the purpose because your purpose is not found in a position. Your, pur your purpose is found in Jesus who then gives you the position. Amen. And the thing is, is that this can be, an, this is an example for our own lives. Amen. If we think about this, we will have unexpected distractions in our lives. If you think about this, Mary was probably anxious because if we think, if we look about it, um, there was a lot of people that was with Jesus. And then they said they were going to her house. It was, I think it was like 70 some people that were with Jesus before. And the thing is, is that. They said, okay, we're going to go now to Mary's house and Martha's house, right? So Martha was probably anxious because she realized all these people were coming, right? So it was an unexpected thing that happened. And that's what happens in our lives. There's things that happen that are unexpected. Yeah, it was 70. If we look in verse, uh, in chapter 10, verse 17, and then the 70 returned again with joy. So these were the same people that were here, right? So Martha probably was anxious because all these people were coming up to her house, but Jesus was there, right? When Jesus entered into the room, I don't care what everybody else is doing. I really don't care. Let me tell you, I'll tell you right now. Don't let your neighbor out worship you. 
Martha let Mary out worship her. When Jesus is in the room, I ain't letting nobody out worship me. I'm going to worship him with all that I have. I don't care how much you worship him. I don't care what y'all doing. But when Jesus is in the room, I'm going to worship him. Don't let your neighbor out worship you. I'll tell you that. Do not let your neighbor out worship you. You worship God with your full heart. Don't worry about what everybody else is doing. Worship God with your full heart. Amen. And even though we may have unexpected distractions, you know, we, the kids in the house may be acting up. You know, our parents may get sick. We may lose our job. All the storms of life can take place in our lives. But no matter what you're going through, keep your eyes on the prize. Mary could have been very well distracted by what Martha was doing. Because you know Martha was on her breath like, if this Mary don't come on. Look at Mary being all lazy, just sitting there. And Jesus is right there. You know, we got to be making, we got to make sure our Messiah is all right. You know, Mary was mum, you know, Martha was mumbling under her breath. And Martha just got fed up and was like, Jesus, tell her, come on, help me, man. And Jesus, what did Jesus say? Martha, Martha, you are careful and troubled about many things. But one thing is needful, and Mary has chosen the good part, which shall not be taken away from her. Jesus said, look, you can try and take her away from her position in me, but you will not. That's one thing that cannot be taken. When you're at the feet of Jesus, there can be other people around you that are not in that position that will be jealous and mad that you're in the position you are. But Jesus is saying here, Mary has chosen that good part, which shall not be taken away from her. When you're planted at the feet of Jesus, let me tell you, I feel the Holy Spirit right now. When you are planted at the feet of Jesus, there is no man that can take you out of that position because God is saying you have chosen the good part. Be planted at the feet of Jesus today, no matter what storm, no matter what distraction, no matter what is coming up in your life. Stay planted at the feet of Jesus because God will tell you that you have chosen the good part by not worrying about what is going around, going all around about you. You're not worrying about the world. You're not worrying about what is happening in the world, but you staying focused on me and me giving you direction on how to handle what is going on all around you. Amen. A lot of times we want to get so focused on cleaning up the things around us when Jesus is even in our presence. And we, sh when Jesus is in our presence, we get so focused on cleaning everything up around and we end up neglecting Jesus when he's right there. When all we got to do is sit at the feet of Jesus and he will be like, all right, come on, let's get this done. All he's asking you first is so that he is to come to his feet that you will have position in, that he will have position in your life. Look, you cannot sing your way into heaven. You can't preach your way into heaven. You can't give your way into heaven. You can't do anything of, you can't do any of these things to get your way into heaven. The only thing you can do to get your way into heaven is having a relationship with him and accepting him in your heart and letting him be Lord of your life. Amen. I'm going to end with Hebrews 4 12. We already know this scripture for the word of God is quick and powerful and sharper than any two edged sword. Piercing even to the dividing of asunder soul and spirit and the joints and the marrow and even the discerner of the thoughts and the intents of a man's heart. Jesus is the word. Amen. Jesus' words are sharper than any two edged sword. When you sit at the feet of Jesus. And let him speak to you. Let the word of God speak to you. It's going to bring you healing and deliverance. And it's even going to expose to you. Let me tell you. When Jesus spoke to Martha. What did he say? You are troubled about many things. Jesus discerned Martha's heart in that moment. That's what the word of God does. When you sit at the feet of Jesus. And you allow him to speak to you. He will show you the thoughts and the intents of your heart. Let me tell you, it ain't pretty sometimes when God reveals to you the intents of your own heart because a lot of times Satan will deceive you and tell you that you're doing all these things because you love God, which you probably do. But the reality is the root cause of this is not because you want to serve. There's an ulterior motive that could be a, rooted in a generational curse. That, and you know, we can get into all that, but that's for another time. But God will reveal to you when you accept, when you, uh, when you approach Jesus, let me tell you, Martha approached Jesus in the wrong aspect. She approached Jesus in complaining about what Mary is doing, but Jesus rebuked her and corrected her. And even when the word spoke to her, it revealed the intents of her heart.
and it showed her. Jesus said, Martha, you be careful. You're troubled in many ways. So when you allow God to speak to you, he will tell you even the thoughts and the intents of your heart. But you got to approach him. Amen. And let me tell you, there's no better way to approach. Je Don't approach Jesus like Martha. Don't approach her in a way that um, that will cause you to be rebuked. I'll tell you it that way. Don't call, don't approach him in a way that it'll cause you to be rebuked. Approach him at the feet. Approach him in a because Martha approached him in a way of receiving something. Martha approached him like, "Look, tell her to come help me." So she he was she was approaching him in a way of gaining something. Martha Mary approached him because the father was there. Mar Mary approached him in the way that I just want to sit at your feet, Jesus, because I love you. And this is what God wants us to do, to approach him in a way, not that, not of something we can gain. That's one thing God has taught me, is when you seek God, do not seek God for his, for his hand. Seek him for his face, because when you seek him for his face, it's just the second nature of God to provide his hand and stretch out his hand for him. So don't only seek God for what he can give you. Seek him for the glory. Seek him for the glory of God. Seek the face of Jesus that the glory of God, the light of Jesus can penetrate and shine on your heart and believe on him that he can come and heal, deliver you, set you free, give you peace, give you restoration. All these things in the inner man first. God wants to provide for you spiritually before he can provide for you naturally. I believe that. You know, God wants to do a work in you. Amen. So allow him to do that by coming to the feet of Jesus. Amen. So Heavenly Father, God, we thank you for this day. God, I thank you for this word. I thank you, God, that you are taking us out of a place of being Martha and bringing us into a place of being Mary. God, I pray today, everybody under the sound of my voice, God, I bind every spirit of distraction, every false Holy Spirit. I bind every religious Kundalini spirit that's coming against us right now in Jesus name. That's distracting us and deceiving us and telling us that we have to work to gain salvation, that we have to work to gain your love, that we have to work or buy people's love even, that we have to do all these things to gain. God, I break every curse on our minds right now in Jesus' name that's deceiving us, that's, th that's making us believe that we have to work to receive from you, God. I take authority over every deceptive spirit right now in Jesus' name, and I pray the helmet of salvation to be activated on each and every one of our minds. That we would take on the mind of Christ today to know, God, that we accept you as our Lord in our heart. That we don't have to do anything to gain salvation, but just receive you in our heart, God. And today, God, we receive you in our heart as Lord. And we pray that you come in and do a work in us, God, that you would heal us, that you would deliver us, God, that you would provide for all of our needs, God, as we seek ye first the kingdom of heaven, God, in your righteousness. God, we seek you for who you are. God, first, God, we seek you and we praise you and we honor you because of who you are and not only what you can do. God, we thank you. We praise you. We give you all the glory, all the honor and praise in Jesus name. And the church says, amen. All right. I love you guys. Next week, Thursday. Love y'all.